from Music for All and presented by Yamaha, it's Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, Composing with Heart, we welcome composers Brian Balmages, Brandon Boyd, Richard Saucedo, and Alex Shapiro, with special guest Bob Morrison. Please welcome the host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Scott Edgar. Welcome back to Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, part two with this great panel of composers. I am Bob Morrison joining us again, where we're going to start to delve into what does it look like when we're teaching this in our classrooms? And sometimes we need to have difficult conversations. Our society and our culture and our schools are calling for difficult conversations. Well, music can be the entry point, that if we hit these head on, we're going to be divisive. But music can be a unifying power where we are able to have these conversations organically in our music educa uh, education classrooms. Um, I want to transition a little bit to a, a thought that we've been having uh, that I've been working with a lot of programs. And when you have multiple layers of ensemble, so you have the elite group and then you have the come one, come all group. And uh, sometimes the directors feel well, hey, it's really easy for me to reach music with heart at that top level when we're really doing that high level musicianship. But how do I dig into emotion with hot cross buns? And how do I really get the students to reflect upon what that looks like? So I know that the entire panel is doing a fantastic job giving a gift to the profession of music at all levels. So Brian, I know you have some thoughts about what this can look like uh, when we're instructing musicians who are bringing different levels of musicianship to the table. I think the first thing that's really important to acknowledge is that it is 100% doable, it's possible to have a very deep emotional connection, um, music that emotionally connects with kids at a very young level. Um, I think so many times we do a disservice of saying, well, they're only second year players, they're only uh, first or third year players, so they're not quite ready to dig into that emotional side of things. Um, I, I like to remind people that you know, the average range of a first year player is anywhere from like nine to 12 years old. And the last time I checked, they're an emotional hot mess, right? Um, there, there's emotions all over the place. And, and so it's not the question of there being a lack of emotion. It's our lack of willingness to write music that can connect with it. Um, and, and so me personally, when I'm, when I'm writing music, one of the things that I'm always asking myself, people always say, is it hard to write music for younger, younger musicians? I think the hardest part about writing younger musicians, and, and I've done music, you know, I've done Alex's music, and I've done several pieces by Richard, that um, the kids immediately grab onto it. They're, they're, there's um, uh, an immediate emotional surge that comes uh, from some of these pieces. And, and um, I think the, the, the thing that we have to really think about is, okay, Number one, if I'm writing music, am I writing a piece that is about an emotion that they are able to find, right? That they're able to identify with. Um, you had mentioned to me, uh, so Colliding Visions, that's a piece of mine that most people know, and I've done that now in an adaptable version as well. But Colliding Visions, the story behind that was it was commissioned by a school in uh, Illinois that had won a grant from the Grammy Foundation because of the strength of their music program. And so everything's like, wow, this is great. You're writing a piece for them. Right before I started writing that piece, I was contacted by the director who told me that due to budget shortfalls and all these other issues, that the program that I was writing for was going to be cut at the end of the year. So I began writing a piece for a band that was no longer going to exist after the premiere. It was the last piece they played before they were gone. And um, you better believe that this idea of colliding visions, one vision of, hey, you're an amazing program, we're gonna give you a grant, and hey, yeah, you're okay, but we just don't wanna pay for you anymore, we don't have the money, we're gonna put it elsewhere. And these kids are all caught in the middle. Um, those kids were able to embrace it and run with it. And, and now kids all over have played this piece, many of whose programs have been either uh, challenged or questioned. Um, and here we are now in a COVID world 
where we're going through it all on a completely other, an additional level. So I think it's important to acknowledge that even in a grade one piece for any of these groups, whether it's choir or, or and Brandon's story was beautiful, right? And, and the person that, that this text we're talking about, we're not talking about 40 year old people, this is a teenage girl, right? And, 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 but a very profound message that was able to link with another artist and create an even more profound message. Um, we have to realize that these kids have a great amount of emotions that are running through them but the challenge is we've got to choose music or as composers write music that harnesses those emotions and allows us to truly let them bring those emotions out and that goes right back to sel because when the kids are playing you've got to give them an outlet because if they don't have an outlet they bottle it up and if they bottle it up it gets worse so give them an outlet if they're upset give them a piece where they can scream at some point in the middle of it if they want to cry give them a piece where they can just sit there and pour their heart out in the middle of a phrase but and if they're just locked up and they just feel like they just fine give them a piece that just lets them feel hyper for three minutes and just get it out but let's use the music to help emotionally whatever stage they're in so that's my thoughts and i don't care if it's young first year or i don't care if it's college or or an adult band who cares it's the same approach perfect brian perfect 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 um, and a lot of what you're talking about, um, especially with that one piece, and I know that your philosophy is that's one piece, but this is more of a philosophy that goes to every composer and every piece, as long as we have that entry point to make these emotions accessible. Uh, but you were with that one piece, you're bringing up a lot with advocacy, and, and we're hearing so many uh, need is such a strong need for advocacy now. And uh, I know Bob and I have talked a lot about how SEL can strengthen the advocacy arguments if that is something that you are in need of. Richard, I want to transition to you now uh, because you've had the unique role of being on the ground day in and day out at Carmel and, and having that K-12 band director role and then the composer. So can you talk about how those worlds collide, how those worlds meld, how it works when you get a piece of music and how do you do what Brian just suggested to use that music at an entry point and reach your students? Well, first of all, I think there's no cooler or neater position to be in than to be um, um, a director who's also a composer. Uh, it gives you lots of different opportunities that, that some directors might not have, um, but it also um, allows me to be pretty specific with the pieces that I'm choosing for my kids because I do want, and I, I can't agree with, with Brian more strongly, um, that this is about emotion for no matter what the age level is. And I wanna give you guys just a, a quick uh, personal story here, and sorry to go that way, but I just, before I did this today with you all, I dropped off my son, who is an eighth grader, I dropped him off at marching band rehearsal as, as an eighth grader. And um, I think it was uh, Brandon who was talking about what kids had not had for a while. And to watch all these kids gather together on the lawn outside the school and look at these kids, and you're thinking high school kids, you know, they're going to be like, wow, great to see you again. They were standing like motionless, almost like they didn't know what to do. You know, and, and then I also got to witness them going inside, sitting down, of course, separated, etc. Okay, and all of a sudden, they're back in that element that they're comfortable with. And you should have seen the way everything changed. Every student literally who was just like this, outside, now that they were part of the group again, they just kind of went. So if you think there's things that we're not gonna have to work on besides just the music things when we get our kids back, um, boy, it's gonna be a rude awakening because uh, my son was scared to death because he, 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 he asked me, he said, dad, how do I act? And I said, oh, that's right. You've been basically in your room for the last five months. And he said, what do I do? I said, just be yourself. Be yourself. He goes, I don't even remember how to do that. And I started laughing, you know, so it, it is going to be very different. But also, um, getting back to what Brian was talking about, too, in terms of being an educator as well as a composer. Um, I can't say enough about making sure that your program is designed for all your players. One of the things that we all get caught, in, caught up in so many times, I think, is we have our program which we're all proud of, 
but we always have this shining top band, you know, that we that tends to do all the trips, that tends to get all the attention, et cetera. And so when we talk about trying to create emotion with younger kids, it makes it even harder if you walk into a group that feels like they're the third or fourth band, all right, instead of another Carmel High School band that's really important. And so what I always used to tell my kids, I would say, you're the only band that exists for me right now. That's, that's all that matters. Okay? So I, I think we do have to think about as composers and as educators, making sure that when we're going through this, even if we're doing it by Zoom or whatever, that we don't ignore our younger members because those are the folks that are gonna build our programs in the future. Now, one more quick story, if you'll indulge me. We're, we've been talking about emotion a lot on this call. And um, I, people will tell you if they've watched me conduct honor bands or if they've watched me conduct my own bands, they'll tell me that I'm kind of crazy emotional because I will cry at the drop of a hat. You know, uh, if I hear a major seventh chord in tune, I'll start crying. You know, so I'm, I'm very emotional with what we do. So we were playing a piece, which you all know, O Magna Mysterium, uh, with uh, the top group at Carmel. And this was just in a rehearsal. And it was near the end of the rehearsal. And we finished, and I cut off that last beautiful chord. And um, uh, something that I always do with um, those kind of pieces is, is I will have my kids hum the chord after they cut it off and then we would cut off the hum. And I got done with that, I finally cut them off, and I looked down and my front row, half of my front row had tears coming down their faces. And I looked down at them and I was like, okay, what am I gonna say, what am I gonna say? And I thought about it and I just looked at them and I said, doesn't get much better than this, does it? And they just shook their heads. Well, the bell rang. I said, man, what a wonderful way to end our rehearsal. You guys were fantastic. I can't wait to continue this tomorrow. See you all tomorrow. No kid moved a muscle. No one moved a muscle. And finally, I looked at him and said, guys, you know, we, we really got to move on. We got we to go to our next class. I finally had, after about two or three minutes, I finally had to say, I am not writing you passes to your next class to get them to go on. And a, a trumpet player in the back put his hand up and he said, but Sauce, they used to call me Sauce, said, well, Sauce, where are we going to get a feeling like that anywhere else in this building today? That's why we don't want to leave. And my point on this is, how do we do that now? How do we do that nowadays? And one of the ways that I think we do it is, first of all, we introduce wonderful pieces like them, whether it's through Zoom or, or whatever, you know, uh, ways we have of connecting with our kids. But I know you all probably at times did the same things I've done in the past where we get in a room, we turn off all the lights, we turn on our stereos, and we turn on our favorite piece. And we lay there, lay there on the floor of the couch and we get emotional listening to it. You know, and I don't think that there's any reason that we can't get our kids into that same mindset, you know, and get them to think emotionally, even though they may not be sitting in that ensemble. Um, and I think that um, as an educator, uh, one of the greatest things to me was to bring a composer's work to life. And I think it is more challenging to do that on Zoom. It is more challenging to do it in the way we have to do it now. But some of those pieces are still wonderful pieces. And we've got to make sure that our kids, we figure out a way to get our kids to feel the emotion of those pieces. They have to understand why they were written, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but I think we can do it in this situation. But we have to give them... I guess, I guess what I'm saying is we can't just do notes and rhythms over Zoom. Somehow we have to get to the next level with them over Zoom. Absolutely, Richard. The inspiration there is, is tangible. It is, it's a call to action that we need to go beyond the notes and rhythms. And, and thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I've been talking to a couple of people, my wife included. The next time that I get on a podium and I drop the baton, I'm going to get through two measures before I'm crying like a baby because that's what I miss. That's what I'm longing for. And the ensemble is going to be like, what's the matter? And I'm going to be like, you know what's the matter. I've missed this. I've longed for this. So, so thank you. So we'll be in that one together. Um, we're going to transition to the reality of where we are as a country right now. And we are dealing with profound, profound challenges in terms of racism, in terms of equity, in terms of people just not being there together and judgment. And these are things that we need to confront in our educational system and we can help our students. 
Um, I firmly believe that social and emotional learning can be an avenue so we can give voice to the voiceless. That's been mentioned twice already, but that we can teach our students that they have a voice and SEL through music can be an avenue to do so. So I would like to throw it out to the panel. Um, how do you see music and music education and social and emotional learning as an avenue so that we can confront the challenges such as racism that our society is dealing with? Richard. I'm, I'm gonna start guys just because I'm gonna tell you, um, when I went to high school, I went to a place called Anderson High School in Anderson, Indiana. And um, there were all kinds of um, uh, different backgrounds in that school. Um, white, Asian, African-American. Uh, I could just go through and list um, all the different uh, backgrounds of folks that were there. And so for me growing up in that band program, some of my best friends were um, uh, some of those folks. So I never even thought, and this is how naive I was, I never even thought about racism back then. You know, my, the people I was talking to at night on the phone, and uh, they were African American, you know? And so when I see this going on out here, and I, I'm sorry to, to get a little emotional here, but I, I just think it's part of how you're brought up. And I do believe very, very strongly that if in our own programs at Carmel, which is a predominantly white school, okay, at Carmel, we would play music of African American composers, right? And I think the fact that they just learn about them in that setting helps them to start to realize the diversity that's out there, at least the diversity in the music world. Because the diversity in the music world, you know, is going to get along. You know we care about the same things. We're there for the same reasons. And so I think that music, I guess I'm one of those idealists that think that if there was more music in people's lives, a lot of the things that were going on right now wouldn't be happening. So I think playing the music of these different composers uh, than the white composers is so important right now. And I, I don't know if even what I'm saying is, is, is proper, the way I'm saying it, because I was brought up in basically a white community. Um, but some of my best friends are from what some people will call some of the minorities. I've never thought of it that way. You know, I don't want my kids to think of it that way. And the best way to, to do that, I think, is to get some of this great music out there by composers of other races, of other countries, of other backgrounds. And I think right there, we can start to make a difference with um, the overall population right there, just starting in our own rooms. Richard, thank you. Spot on. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree with you more that we need to diversify the demographic of composers. If we are going to inspire our students to be future musicians and to have, you not even professional musicians, but just to be musicians in life, they need to be exposed to music by people that looks like them and people that sound like them and that has the same voice as them. So home run. Absolutely. Alex, please. Yeah, just to, just to continue what Richard was saying, it's it's absolutely a diversity of composers and their voices and going deeper using that music to teach history and to teach reality to the students. A lot of these pieces have stories behind them, have some of those stories are extremely painful. They have to be heard. And especially for kids like the ones who are lucky enough to go to a school where they're not presented maybe with the realities of daily life as many other people see it they need to be exposed to it, they need to be taught it, and they need to, of course, have empathy and compassion. So music is a way of doing that. It's, I'll use that word again, it's a portal to information and to, and to empathy and to compassion. Let me give you an example um, on, uh, this isn't a racial issue, it's a women's rights issue. I recently had a commission last year, I had a premiere of an electroacoustic choral work, SATB choral work. And I, I could choose any text I wanted to. I chose a text from 484 years ago. Anne Boleyn, when she was awaiting her beheading in the Tower of London, wrote an amazing madrigal text called, O oh Death, Rock Me Asleep. And she was, of course, about to be murdered by her husband and government, uh, quite unfairly. He just, you know, Henry VIII just wanted to move right on to Jane Seymour. <laughs> he married her a few days later. Um, 
I, when I got the chance to speak to the audience, because another thing that's really great, we haven't really touched on this, is whether it's via video or in person, a composer has the bully pulpit, a conductor has the bully pulpit, pulpit. We're at the lip of the stage. We have a chance to chat with the audience and also, of course, during rehearsals with the, with the students and to open their minds, just as I was talking about with environmental issues earlier. Well, in this case, I got to speak very directly to the audience about how 484 years ago, not enough has changed. We still have women around the world, in most many in other countries where the harshest uh, versions of Sharia penal codes are enforced, being, you know, torched, being burned, being stoned, being lashed, and yes, being beheaded in 2020. And we have to talk about this. And this is getting back to when we were talking about the voice for the voiceless. If our music can raise issues, whether it's for racial equity or women's equity or anything else, if we can talk about these issues through the pieces and let the pieces sort of speak for themselves without us even having to lecture the audience. You know, when I, when I uh, talk about an environmental piece, I don't have to tell them what to think about climate change. I just have to let them see some images and hear some hopefully moving music that goes with the images and maybe and, and point to the students behind me and say, these are the stewards of our earth, right? Everybody knows that. It's the same thing with anything that's a little bit more, more charged in, uh, in, in its topic. So it's very, very powerful, the stories with the music, and that's SEL. Absolutely, Alex. And, and there's something that um, I think might be going through some of the directors watching this, and they're saying, well, I don't, my, my kids are too young for this, or, or my kids aren't ready for this. And I firmly believe that every kid is ready for every single conversation that we need to have with them. We just need to present it in a way that is developmentally appropriate. You know, I use the word, the verb, Mr. Rogering. We need to take these big, huge challenges and put them in a way that is digestible, that's developmentally appropriate, that's going to meet the students where they are and take them to a place of growth. We do a huge disservice to any young person by thinking we're shielding them from such realities of life. First of all, at any age, starting, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, they're all on social media. They all watch, you know, the television. They are completely bombarded with these days pretty ugly messages. These days especially. And that's a whole nother conversation. You know, how in the world do we do we talk about the world as the world currently is? Uh, and what led, all the things that led to what the world currently is, such a confusing and sometimes hideous place, um, that it, we do a disservice if we do not directly talk about this. They're getting it whether we like it or not. We can help present it in a way that can be forward moving. Brian. I'm actually going to yield to Brandon and let him go first and then I'll, okay. uh, I'll jump I'll in. I'll be quick, I'm I promise. Kidding. Yeah. Fantastic. Brandon. Uh well, one of the, the, the joys, I guess, when I went to graduate school, finally, um, I, I think I finally found the joy of the music of the African-American tradition. And that was because I studied with a man who um, wrote a lot of it. And I mean, it has gone all over the world and he's very proud of it and kind of had a very similar start to me. Was not as proud of the music initially because of maybe some of the, the, the history. Um, but I learned to be proud of it, and that is the African-American spiritual. And that, the, the emotional, the jarring that a spiritual can do to your psyche once you realize how it was birthed and how it influenced American music, I mean, it's enough right there to tell you that it, it's one of the most, to me, I feel it's one of the most important and most influential aspects of American music. I mean, you go to other countries and what do people call American music? They think of Broadway. They think of, it. that's entertainment, it's expression, it's theater, it's all of those things. But if you really get down to the heart of what American music is, it's birthed out of the African spiritual, out of the religious music that, I mean, some is religious, some sacred, but it's how was this country birth, birthed? And, and they were through some bad experiences of some people who look like me. I mean, uh, I, I'm African-American, but I had no idea of the struggle of, of slaves in this country. And, and, and out of that, let me say, they were slaves, but they knew the importance of music and singing. Now that's no, that's no downfall of you band people, 
But no, just kidding. It is, but seriously, it is, it, 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 it's something that births, it just comes out of human expression, the natural ability to hum, to be able to emote through something. I used to hear my grandmother in the kitchen humming. And was her voice good? The answer is no. But her, the emotion behind every tune that she sang in her humming was that from her belly. I mean, it was just, you could tell she needed to do it. Um, and anyway, back to the spiritual. I'm so proud of it now. Uh, that is one of the things that I probably do more than I compose. I, you all, most of you are more composers than I am. But arranging is a thing that I find comfort in doing. And that's taking some of those African folk melodies into um, giving them a, a, a contemporary version, but never leaving behind those stories that belong to that, that tune or that text uh, so that young singers, young performers, young players can understand that this music was birthed out of a very harsh experience. Slaves did not come over here on the carnival cruise line, you know. They need to know that. They need to know that this was an involuntary uh, action. And and it's it's a it's a way to say, how is that connected to some of the things that we still see in today, okay? If you think it just started in the 70s, the 50s, and 60s, then you, you're really out to lunch, okay? But I will tell you this, some of our students believe that. And I hate to tell you, some of their parents believe that because we don't share these stories that I think are so important in our American history, not just American history, it's still yet our music history. It's our history. It's not black people's history, it's not white people, it's our. And I think I have one charge in life and it is not to create an us and them ever. And it's to create this combination that we are all human. We've all had, you know, we leave and get in our different cars and uh, go to our different addresses. But when we come together, it's that one reminder again, that we're all human and we're all here together. And we're brothers and sisters and cousins and friends or whatever you feel that connects you to another person in a very affectionate and loving way. And that's just my two cents and I'll press pause there. Brandon, I'll take those two cents every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Thank you for okay. that perspective. I appreciate that. Um, and you know, the, the big thing that you're getting at is the humanity and the entry points and what that looks like for music education. So I appreciate uh, you giving us those tangible examples for what it looks like in our music classroom and some of these ways. Brandon, can I ask you to unpause a little bit because I'm going to ask a challenging question because I know that we have some people out there who are maybe white directors who are saying, I can't do a spiritual because that's not my background. Can you address that a little bit? I sure can. I don't ever want to hear that again, because that means I can't do classical music. That is ridiculous. Okay, now what you might have to do is some homework. I think what it is, is it's me. It's a perfect example of me. If I can't sight read it, I don't know, oh gosh, I can't play it. What do I have to do? I have to put some muscle in. Oh, God, I have to go back and really practice that little section. Really, really. And, and I often do that when someone says, well, you play from my recital. Okay, tell me the literature first. It's how much work do I want to put into it? That's what I hear people say when they say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. And if you don't know how, then call someone who does. It's like me. I don't know Mandarin, and I'm not sure that any of you do. But if you have a student, or if you have a contact or a resource, use it. And that's, that's, that's basically all I want to say about that, because I hear that question quite often, and immediately I want to just kind of shake that person and say, what if your students walked in? Every student said, I can't read music. I can't read music. I can't play 16th notes. I can only play quarter notes. You know, we don't ever take the easy road out. Find that it is more important that what it is you do um, in teaching, teaching is more important than your ability to always do it. Sometimes we, I'm sure you know this, sometimes you know that, well, I guess all of us can agree, we know the piece much better at the end of the semester than we do at the beginning of the semester. Don't you agree? I know you do. Yes, because you've had experience with it. You've lived with it. And that's what you have to do with anything you don't know. Live with it you know, and experience it. It probably is the same way with marriage. I mean, you think you know them. Yeah, you might not know them as well as you do. But by the end of your life, you start to discover there's still yet new things about the person you call your better half um, or half or whatever you call them. 
Brandon, thank you. Brandon, thank you. Uh, and, and so much of what we're looking at right now, I'm, in my mind, I'm trying to think of how do we translate for the SEL. It's recognizing your strengths and your needs and being able to ask for help. You know, I, I think so often we as directors think, hey, I need to have all the answers. Uh-uh. If, and I, I think what I love the most is if you have a kid who speaks Mandarin, ask for their help. You know, acknowledge the voice of the people who are in front of you. Thank you so much for that. Brian. So remind me, Brandon, next time not to let you go first because I don't want to have to follow all that. That's, that's, that's not cool, but we're going to try. Um, I, I think it's important that we remember that music is an incredible vehicle to dive into social issues that people are uncomfortable talking about without even talking about them sometimes. Like it, it's a great way to introduce it. And then yes, things will come up, but they come up naturally. It, it's one thing to just sit down and say, we're gonna talk about racism today. Um, you polarize the room right away. Um, but if you do a piece um, that explores, like, like a great uh, Omar Thomas, who I know might be on this at some point, but um, he's a great friend and a great composer, but he has a mother of a revolution, which is all about Martha Johnson and, and the entire, that entire movement. Um, and, and if you were to say, hey, we're gonna talk about trans people today and trans, and all, it's gonna get very awkward and very uncomfortable. But if you play a piece and then you say, all right, let me explain to you what's going on here. It's a very natural progression and it's a very uh, uh, organic way of, of bringing up some of these issues. And, and I think, as we bring up some of these issues, the other important part is to recognize how important it is to bring up these issues. Um, I, I'm going to be full out for a second and just say that there is a time in my life where when people said like, oh, um, we're so um, gay and lesbian people are so oppressed and, and, and so discriminated against. And I would think to myself, I have gay and lesbian friends, so I'm fine. That's not me. I'm, I'm okay. And then people would say, oh, and, and um, there's so many racists out there. And I would say, oh, I have, ra I have black friends. I'm good. Check that box. And, and I think it's important to realize that just because you have black friends or just because you program the piece of a black composer or just because you have um, friends that are members of the LGBTQ community, doesn't mean that you don't have work to do. And, and how do I know I had work to do? To be quite honest, one of the first ways that I know is that I can look back years ago, and I remember when the whole Black Lives Matter movement kind of was born, and then you would see all these people say, well, all lives matter. And here I am, an ignorant person who has black friends, so I'm not racist. And so I look at that and I say, well, of course, why wouldn't they just say all lives matter? not realizing, not taking the time to invest in the fact that this is not about only Black Lives Matter. It's the question of they matter also. They matter too. That they deserve the same amount of respect and the same amount of focus that me being the privileged white guy has, right? And, and I didn't get that. And that to me shows, okay, wait a minute. I have a lot more work to do. Yes, I have black friends. And yes, I, I make new black friends all the time, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of work to do. And if I question that, I look back at that moment. And I say, wow, when people say all lives matter now, I cringe and I think, how, how dare you say that? That was me, that was me. But I didn't mean it like that, but I didn't take the time to understand what it meant. These are the conversations that we need to be having. And these are the, the conversations that music can help us have in a non-threatening way. And this is the way, I mean, you can, you can play some of these pieces in the reddest of states, the most, the most racist of all states, and, and just open up a conversation and people will enjoy the music. And it, it just, you plant a seed and then you do what you can. Um, and so I think it's really important to realize that th these are all the things that we're trying to do with music, but we're trying to plant seeds and we're trying to bring up issues and we're trying to acknowledge that it it's everywhere and all of us can do a better job, right? All of us can make a better contribution and better acknowledge um, the, what, what we have, the privilege we have and the privilege that other people don't have. I mean, my wife is reading the book Stamped right now. It's a great book. If you don't have, if you haven't read it, read it. But one of the, one of the, um, and I'm going to read it after her. It's just that she's running a book study on it. So don't worry. I'm not saying it was all my wife. But, you know, 
one of the reasons that we went waged war against England was because they were liberating the slaves. They were getting rid of slavery. And here we were, uh, a whole area which was fat, like uh, tobacco was thriving. And the United States, we didn't want, well, the colonies at the time didn't want to forego slavery because we wanted all that, we needed them for the tobacco. So one of the reasons that we became independent was because we didn't want to get rid of slaves. That's important to look back at all that and realize like, okay, yeah, we're the country of the free and all that, but are we yet, right? And so I think those are all important things. Music can help us get there. Ryan, thank you. And, and this dialogue um, is a model for what it can look like in our classrooms. And, you know, I, I, from a personal note, I put out the prompt and then all these perspectives came out. I didn't know what everyone was going to say. It takes a leap of faith to say, what do you have to say about this? And I think everyone here on this panel can say, we've learned something. We've learned something from different perspectives. And now we have new ideas that are going to spawn more questions. I hope after you watch this, that you leave with more questions than answers. Um, Bob, I, I saw that you had something and maybe um, we can throw it to you to uh, throw in your two cents here, but then transition. Um, you know, one thing that you've made a career out of is having a vision. And I would love to hear a little bit about your thoughts about a vision moving forward in music education uh, with this as a backdrop. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, first I want to respond to, or at least piggyback on something that, that Brandon said and then something that, that Brian said. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life that, you know, my career pathway has been all over the place, you know, intersecting with different aspects of, um, of government and entertainment and education and advocacy and policy. And one of the, one of the great joys that I had was about, 18 years ago, uh, when I was working at Viacom, I was working on a project with Quincy Jones called Say It Loud, The History of Black Music in America. And it was a multi-part series. Um, and I think that there was like a dozen episodes that really went through the whole process of the history of black music in America and the influence that it had on music in America, period, as, as Brandon was saying. And I think that it's, it, it's one of the aspects of music that really isn't told very well. And I was inspired, you know, recently, it's just like, you know what, we may need to reach out to Quincy's production folks and say, can we bring that back? Can we bring that into our educational repertoire? Because it, it was so rich and so inspiring. And I learned, I mean, it, it just showed me how little I knew at the time and how little I still know in going back through it. But the ability to work with that, and then our role was to develop educational content for cable in the classroom so that teachers would be able to record these overnight on their um, cable television systems and then use it in the classroom. And we would provide the lesson plans to go along with it. So that journey of going through that process with Quincy and his team from an educational aspect was just really awe-inspiring to me, and I was so fortunate to have it. But the, the, to connect to what Brian said about um, how this uh, connects to uh, current events and our society, I was at a presentation or at a, a board ceremony in 2015 where uh, Congressman John Lewis was being recognized and being honored. Uh, and I refer to John Lewis as kind of this living, walking monument you know, in our history. And he said something at that uh, award ceremony when he was receiving the award. And he, he, he was telling his story about growing up in Alabama and raising his chickens and his involvement in the civil rights movement and in his work with Dr. King. And he said at the end of it, he goes, you know, without music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. And after he said that, I just sat there for a moment, trying to process exactly what he said and exactly what does that mean. Uh, and that then spun me off on an entire journey where I was then digging into um, issues around uh, music and its connection to the creation of our country, to our, our long, rich history. And then uh, I got to the point where I called up his office and I said, I'd really like to sit down and interview uh, Congressman Lewis to understand what's behind that statement. Help me understand what's behind that statement. And so I had the opportunity to sit down with him with a camera crew for about 30 minutes and talk about 
what did you mean by that? And he went on and waxed eloquently about the role that music played in keeping, um, uh, keeping everyone motivated, keeping everyone inspired. He talked about the music that they would sing on the buses as they were going from Alabama. He talked about uh, what some of the artists that joined them, Harry Belafonte and others, how they would be singing together. He talked about what they were singing in the jail cells in Birmingham. And it was so moving and so inspiring that it comes back to connecting us to the role that it plays in important moments in our history. And we can't shy away from those. And we actually should embrace those and really understand the way that music is so entwined to the fabric of this country and moments that we have that are both great and painful. And we shouldn't shy away from telling those stories. So uh, th those are two moments that, that I can uh, connect to that really brought me greater awareness to um, both social justice and social injustice uh, that occurs in this nation and the role that we can play in utilizing music to help illuminate those opportunities. Now, when we think about how we look forward, you know, where does this go and where does this take us? Um, you know, we've just, uh, we've been working on this and I personally have been working on social emotional learning and, and music education, arts education, not very long, only for about three years. And Scott and I have been working uh, together on this uh, almost two years. And the thing that um, has struck me is that the work that we were doing for the first 18 months was plotting along, right? We were planning, we were doing research, we were trying to understand the intersection of the arts and uh, SEL and how does it relate to the, the, the standards and how does the standards connect to the social emotional learning competencies. And then all of a sudden in the past four months, somebody strapped boosters onto this topic and lit them on fire. Um, and we have been holding on for dear life as everyone is starting to realize the important role that SEL plays in education and the really unique role that music and arts education has in exciting social emotional learning in our students. And so I think that we are on the precipice of a, of a real uh, evolution in music education. I've told other people, I think that we're on, we're on the precipice of a renaissance in music and arts education in this country uh, because of the opportunities that we have to think differently about our approach and rethink how we move forward uh, with music education in this environment that we are in uh, and how do we bring along the things that we were experimenting with, with over the last three months and how will they remain with us as we move forward. And one of the things that I want to call out is uh, I'm really inspired by the, the, the creative repertoire uh, initiatives. I, I think that um, the way that all the composers uh, came forward and, and kind of raced into the fire going, we know you're going to have challenges and we are going to come up with solutions for you. I thought it's been, been brilliant and, and a hat tip to Alex and, and Robert and all the folks that are involved in that. But I think that's an indication right there of the shift that's going on in music education, the opportunity that it's creating, because it now is saying, students, you do have a way to be involved. You, you can have a voice. You can influence and have shape over the creative product, not just be the one sitting there and performing it. And I think the more that we understand these intersections between the artistic process of creating, performing, responding, and connecting, and SEL and the SEL competencies, and the more we make that work intentional, the, 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 the greater the impact that we are gonna have on our students. And I think the greater that we're gonna impact that we are gonna have in education. And whether that education is what's happening in our schools, or whether that education is the way that we are training our teachers, or our, our pre-service uh, students to become teachers, or the professional development for our current teachers, or the way that our uh, publishers are writing method books to what we've just talked about, the way our composers are approaching writing their own music. This is a really, really exciting time. It's a traumatic time, it's a terrible time, but it is also incredibly creative. And the opportunity to make the most of it is what's in front of us. It's just up to all of us to embrace it and go with it. 
Bob, thank you for those words sending us forth. Absolutely. Um, this for me is the starting place and I cannot wait to see what this series is going to turn into. Uh, the good news is you're going to have a voice in helping us develop what the series is going to look like moving forward. I would like to, from the bottom of my heart, thank Bob, Alex, Brian, Brandon, and Richard for spending some time with us today. We talk about flow. We looked at our watches and we were like, oh my goodness, we've been talking. And that's just because this is what happens when we give people voice and choice to talk about the humanity that is inside of music. So thank you so much to the entire panel for spending some time with us this afternoon. A few things moving forward. Please click on the link at the bottom of the uh, screen right now and submit ideas. Who do you want to see on the next episode of teaching social and emotional learning through music? We'll reach out to them. We'll try to get them on to talk about their great work and how we can provide that as a resource when you are teaching their music to really dig deeper and teach music with heart. With that, we all wish you the best. We wish you safety. We wish you well-being. And we'll see you next time. Take care.